and you realize you're in the minority. You notice most people aren't saved, right? Most people don't care about God. They use the name of Jesus as a cuss word, right? So here we are in the world in which we live, and yet we live a life that is a life of light, a light, a life that glorifies Jesus Christ in everywhere that we go and all that we do. Hallelujah. And uh, I was relating um, Zariah and I a little bit today. We saw some of the highlights from the Diamondbacks. So they won in Philadelphia, and everybody in that stadium was Philadelphia Philly fans. We saw a video of two ladies. <laughs> Out of, you know, 30,000 people, and they're holding up a sign that says, Go D-backs. That's how you can feel as a Christian sometimes. Everybody else loves perverted things. They love foul things of the world. Uh, they tell uh, foul jokes, right? They have their funky conversation, the F word, every other word. And here we are supposed to stand for Jesus and glorify him in the middle of a wicked and perverse and crooked generation. But I want to tell you something. I was proud of those ladies. They were unashamed. They're, they wore Diamondbacks jerseys. They're holding up their Diamondbacks thing. And you know what? How much more should we glorify our King and our Lord and our Master, hallelujah, in this world in which we live? We come into his house tonight. We glorify him. We honor him. And uh, I agree with Richard. I mean, I'm, I'm believing for the Diamondbacks to have a miracle. But I'm just saying to you. The one I'm cheering for is Jesus Christ, hallelujah. He is the champion on the white horse, amen. He has never lost a battle. He's never lost a game, hallelujah. He's gonna win no matter what happens and we can glorify him and honor him. And I wanna tell you, church, you plus the Holy Ghost equals a majority. Doesn't matter what anybody else is saying or doing. If you will stand for God, the Lord will stand with you, hallelujah. And we can praise him and glorify him no matter what's going on in our life, in our world, or whatever it might be. So let's come before him tonight. We're in his house, amen. We are his people. He is our father in heaven. He is our king and our Lord. Let's come before him and believe him to move for our needs and requests. We wanna pray for our nation, a miracle of revival. We wanna lift up our military. There's been actually, our military members have been wounded in uh, Syria, amen, by these crazy uh, Muslim terrorists that are firing at our bases. There's a number of people and military people that are deployed into that area right now. There's a couple of carriers over there and uh, there's American troops on the ground that are gonna get ready to go in. They're sending 2,500 Marines into Israel. And so there's some very intense things happening and there's people in our fellowship that have family over there, even people from our fellowship that are there right now. And so we need God, amen, to protect them, watch over them. Let's lift up the nation of Israel, amen, God to watch over them and protect his nation. We want to remember as well, our daughter churches, amen, in Litchfield and Sign Alto, granddaughter church in Rio Grande. And also we want to pray for Nicaragua, God to move there. I want to remember our focus fire request tonight, amen, uh, both here in uh, America and overseas, uh, God to move there and devour and God to minister. We wanna pray for our building situation, church. I got the uh, proposal uh, details over to our realtor today. So hopefully tomorrow that will get submitted. And so please keep that in your prayers. We need a miracle of God to give us favor on that proposal. So let's lift that before the Lord. We also wanna pray for salvation for a number of people, Martinez and Valdivia families, Lupe Chavez, Johnny and Louis. Alexis, Carlos, Alana, and Destiny. We need to pray, amen, uh, that God would move in healing uh, for uh, John's friend, uh, has a spot on his lung, his name is Dick. Also prayers for Glenn, recovering from heart surgery. We need to pray for Abel, Serna, Isaac, Adam, all these sick, a little under the weather tonight, and God to move for them. Wanna pray for Sister Maggie, a complete healing in her body from cancer. Brother Jaime over in Litchfield, God to do a miracle there. We also wanna pray for Roli Gakote, one of our pastors in the Philippines. His liver is about to fail, so we need a miracle of God for him. And also please pray for my dad. Uh, he went in yesterday for an eye exam and it wound up that his retina had become detached from his eye. So he had that surgery today and there's a bit of recovery that's involved. And so please pray for my dad if you would, a quick recovery for him. And I know a while back we were praying for um, Danielle Oropesa, 
Amen. For a while now, she's been out of the hospital. Her lung is attaching properly in her chest cavity. And so God is bringing a miracle of healing to her. So thank God for that. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, and we're going to pray for these others as well. We want to pray for Jose and Sebastian, Kyle, Alyssa, and BJ, and be leaving God to move across the board in all these things. How many of you have something personal you want to lift to God with your hand and also your heart? You speak your needs to the Lord. Let's pray together about these requests. I'm going to ask John DeVivo to come and open us with a word of prayer. Let's pray right now. Lord, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you are powerful, God, and awesome. That nothing is impossible for you, Lord. Even as your people pray before you tonight, God, meet the needs that they speak out before you, God, that as they ask, uh, they will receive, God. As they seek, they will find and knock. The door will be open to them. Uh, give us miracles of healing, miracles of salvation, uh, miracles of finances, God. We need your grace and your power in this place, God. Help us. Oh, Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. Roll our prayers, Lord. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor you deserve, Lord. Lord, we ask that you move in our building situation, Lord. You know what we need, and you can yes. give it to us, Lord. We're praying against witchcraft, Lord. We're binding it. We're sending back the evil words right back to the sender, Lord. We're praying for all our needs we need in this church and in our fellowship, Lord. We ask that you touch our pastor tonight and speak your word. And in my name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Get around a little bit. Say hello near and far. God richly bless you tonight. Welcome to church. Amen. Good to see all of you tonight. And we welcome you all to the midweek service here. Amen. In Peoria, we thank you all for coming. And may God richly bless you. Those visiting, we welcome you as well. And God bless you. Those online, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to all that God's going to do tonight. A few quick announcements. Um, this Friday is going to be a time of street preaching over at um, 67th in Peoria. And so we'll be meeting here at 7 p.m. Brother Richard Jr. is leading the charge. We have Ken Honorkamp going to come over from Tempe and rap out on the street. Lift up Jesus. Amen. And so I encourage you to be part of that, especially the young people. I encourage you to come and be part of it. We'll have the van here. Uh, so I encourage you. We can load up the van, get everybody there and back to the church. And encourage you very much to come. Let's lift up Jesus Christ. It's witchcraft month. Halloween, right? But no, 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 no. We take, what did I tell you before? The devil gets no holidays. Amen? He gets nothing. Hallelujah. And we're going to glorify Jesus Christ in the middle of Halloween season. And I want to encourage you to come with the church. Amen. Young people, encourage you to come. Let's go and lift up Jesus together. So we'll meet here at 7 and then go out there about 730 and uh, outreach for a period of time and then be back afterwards so we encourage you for that saturday there's two outreaches happening um at 1 45 john devivo is doing his assisted living outreach you can see him for details about that if you're able to help him also then in the evening from five to eight is our trunk retreat appreciate everybody who's signed up a lot of help that's ready to go 
Uh, Richard Jr. will be getting you details and whatever is needed and encourage you to be ready for that. And we're gonna have a great time on Saturday night. It's one of our best outreaches all year. So I wanna encourage you, amen, be brushed up on your scriptures, be brushed up on the Romans road. Right, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 8, 9, and 10, or Romans 10, 9, and 10. I wanna encourage you to know what that is and that will help lead people to Christ and encourage you to do that. Also, John 3.3, 3, does everybody know what John 3.3 3 says? No? Come on, y'all, John 3.3? 3, 3? You must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? They need to know that. And John 3.16, everyone know John 3.16? Oh, okay, Jacob knows it, the 10-year-old. Come on, y'all. Wake up tonight. Hallelujah. We're in church. Amen. Let's let's get our, our thinking minds here. Hallelujah. John 3, 16. So I encourage you to be a witness for the Lord that night. And we have a lot of things going on for that. Then Sunday, amen, 10 a.m., our continued series on the memorial stones with Pastor Greg. And then both 11 a.m. and 6.30, our services, we're doing a little bit of a different Sunday services. I'm doing two deliverance services. So we'll be handing these out on Saturday night at the trunk or treat. So please have a few of these with you at your car. Get them to people as they go through. Also take some with you. There's English on one side, Spanish on the other. Amen. It says depression, anxiety, hearing voices, panic attacks, suicidal, tormented. And then it says no more because there's hope in Jesus. Amen. I like that flyer. Hallelujah. Anyways, amen. Encourage you for that. Amen. We're going to believe God to set people free on Sunday. Use it as a tool to bring in sinners and those that do not know the Lord. Draw them in. We're going to believe God and be praying for that too. The evening time, there's a water baptism. And I encourage you to sign up or let me know if you need to be baptized. That'll be a blessing. And let's have our ushers come tonight. We want to receive God's tithe and our offerings tonight. In our text from the Sunday night service, I wanted to remind you about, amen, uh, this was, remember, uh, Thursday night of our revival uh, last week, evangelist J.W. Ballinger gave us this as a word of knowledge to our church, and I want to encourage you and remind you about it, that this is very important, that we take hold of what God speaks to us and we apply it, amen, in our lives. And so I preached on it Sunday night, but just to remind you of the verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, again, the therefore means in light of all that it just said, and it's talking about the rapture. It's talking about the sudden, quick, unexpected return of Jesus, which can be at any second. Therefore, it says, in light of that, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So here's a truth tonight I wanted to give you. God is still on his throne. The government's not in control. God is. Your boss is not in control. God is. The doctor's not in control. God is. The devil's not in control. God is. That's our God, church. He's in control, man. And it's very wise to practice that verse in our giving, in our finances. It's wise to be steadfast. Faithful in our giving. To be immovable. You know what? It's always going to be right to tithe. It's always going to be right to give offerings besides to God, right? That's the Bible truth. Be immovable in your convictions. Don't let that get loose on you. Be immovable. Always abounding. If you remember, that actually means to seek to labor in an excessive way. Always abounding in your giving. Seek to increase your giving, not to decrease it. Find ways 
to give more as the time and the day approaches of the Lord's return, always abounding. And it says, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You have to remember something. Whatever you give to God, he notes and he remembers and he will reward. He noted the widow with two little mites and he remembered her, put her name, her gift, should I say, in the eternal word of God. And whatever you have given is written in his book as well. And I want to encourage you in that. Know that your labor in giving is not in vain of the Lord. Our God reigns. He's in control. And so let's be steadfast. Let's be immovable. Let's always abound in the work of the Lord. Let's put the text that I used and that God gave us last week into practice in our giving and our finances. God will supply all we need. And he will provide for us as we trust him and obey him. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads together. Praying for the offering tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Brother Dave Collins, please pray, brother. We bring the sacrifice. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. And we offer unto you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer unto you the sacrifices of joy. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. And we offer unto you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer unto you the sacrifices of joy. Platform. May God richly bless you tonight. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles tonight to Psalm 90. Psalm 90 tonight. We're going to read a few verses there, 9 through 12. And I was very stirred tonight, and, and uh, just so we're sure, I am preaching to our young people, but I'm also preaching to all people. Is anyone here a person? If you're a furry, then we can pray for you and God can deliver you. Hallelujah. But we're all people here tonight, and, and the truth is, each one of us is made in the image of God. And a life that will be a life and a, a person that chooses to fully surrender to God. To fully pursue His will for your life. Has amazing potential in it. Just one life. Recently, Monica and I went uh, for our 30th anniversary. We took a trip to the East Coast and we wound up going to Billy Graham's library in Charlotte, North Carolina. So... Billy Graham, of course, was a pastor for many, many, many years. And this is a guy that grew up on a farm in North Carolina, a dairy farm. And at a very young age, he gave his heart to Christ. He chose to obey God's call to be a pastor. And he preached the gospel for more than 60 years. And... For his life, he obeyed God. That, that's really what he did. He didn't let himself get distracted. He just stayed on track with serving God. You know, Billy Graham led over 2.2 million people in the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus into their hearts. He preached, they, they say, to over 2 billion people in his lifetime. Just one life, but a life that's surrendered, a life that's yielded to God. And there is an opportunity for each one of us to do the exact same thing 
That opportunity is open to you right now. If you're a child, if you're a young person, if you're middle-aged like me, or you're older, your life has potential in God. Doesn't matter what your past is. Doesn't matter what arenas you've struggled in or are struggling in, your failures, the potential remains for your life because, again, you are made in the image of God. So I want to encourage you tonight, young people, some of us that aren't so young anymore, choose surrender. Fully pursue God's will for your life and fulfill your potential in God. So I want to preach about realizing your potential. Psalm 90, I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation, a little different version, but we're going to read 9 through 12. The second part of verse 9 is where we'll begin. Our days soon become years until our lifetime comes to an end, finished with nothing but a sigh. You have limited our lifespan to a mere 70 years, yet some you give grace to live longer. But even the best of years are marred by tears and toils, and in the end, with nothing more than a gravestone in a graveyard. We're done or we're gone so quickly, so swiftly. We pass away and simply disappear. Lord, who fully knows the power of your passion and the intensity of your emotions? Help us to remember that our days are numbered and help us to interpret our lives correctly. Set your wisdom deeply in our hearts so we may accept your correction. Amen. Realizing your potential. So let's think first of all about the powerful potential of every life. You know, God is our creator. And God has created people such that all lives matter. I know there's some political things here and there that say certain lives matter more than other lives. That's not true with God. All lives matter to Him. And He has created all of us with a potential to do amazing and powerful things with our life for Him. And the Bible records those that God used. And remember, when you read the Bible, you're reading about people just like you. Same fears, same struggles, same mistakes. Human beings, flesh and blood, just like us. And God used these people. So God used a number of children. You know, Samuel, who became a prophet, God began to speak to him at eight years old. God began to call him by name and make himself known to Samuel. He gave him a word of knowledge for the priest Eli when he was eight. We know Josiah, the king of the Old Testament, he became the king at eight years old. We know Jeremiah, where we're reading in our Bible reading right now, when you read the beginning part of his life in Jeremiah 1, in verse 6, he said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child but the Lord said to me, Say not, I am a child, for you shall go to all that I shall send you, and whatsoever I command you, you shall speak. So here he is, a little guy, and God began to call him to be a prophet unto the nations. In fact, Jeremiah's prophecies are still coming to pass today. And God started speaking to him when he was a child. God used children. God used teenagers and youth. Most commentators believe that when David killed Goliath, he was about 11 years old. Just remember that story for a minute. 
All the adults, all his brothers, they don't want to go out against Goliath. They're, they're shaking in their boots. But David said in his little 11-year-old voice, I'll go out and fight him. Who is this on the circumcised Philistine? <laughs> Think about that. And the other part about David you may not know is, is the Bible says he was ruddy. In the Hebrew, that means red hair. So David probably had freckles, and he looked like Opie from the Andy Griffith show. That's who David was. And David killed Goliath. God used him to work a great miracle. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was about 15 when she birthed the Savior. We have an interesting account in Acts 21, 8 and 9. It's later in the church's history. And Paul and his group were traveling, and it says in verse 8, The next day we that were with Paul departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. And verse 9 says, The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So here are four young ladies. They're not married yet. They're still living at home, but they were being used by God as prophets in the church. So God used youth. God even used middle-aged people. It's a miracle. You know, Isaac, Abraham and Isaac, Isaac got married at 40. Isaac and Rebekah, and of course they birthed Jacob and Esau, right? But Isaac didn't get married till he was 40. In Numbers 4, it uh, describes those that will be the helpers of the priests in the temple, the Gershomites and the Kothathites and all these ites that are there, these different families. Uh, and God specifically said, I want the people that are of these families to come and work in my temple, everyone who's 30, up to 50. So you couldn't go and minister in the temple as one of those family members until you reached the age of 30. And then you ministered until you were 50. So people with middle-aged time frame, God said, I have a place for you in my house to labor in and I'm going to use you, amen, in my house. And uh, they were going to do that from age 30 to 50. Remember, Jesus Christ, his ministry was from the age of 30 to the age of 33. His public ministry. So everything we read about Jesus, except when he's little, when he's 12, or when he's born, or when he's 12, is he was 30 to 33. In Acts 4, when uh, Peter and John are on their way to prayer, and the lame man asks them for alms, and they bring healing to him, that guy, it says, was over 40 years old that that miracle happened to, and he was a powerful testimony for God in his generation and in Jerusalem at that time, over 40, and a middle-aged man that God healed and God used. We also have God using old-timers. Did you know Abraham did not get called to follow God until he was 75? Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees when he was 75 to go to the land of Canaan, to a land that God would show him. And he didn't have Isaac until he was 99. So older man, yet he's the father of our faith. We know that Caleb was like this, this man in the Old Testament. So he was a part of the, tri the, the tribes of Israel that came out of Egypt in the Exodus. And uh, he was part of the original 12 spies that went in to spy out the land. And when they came back, the 10 gave an evil report. But Joshua and Caleb gave a positive report. We can take the land. That's when he was 40 years old. And then 45 more years passed by wandering through the wilderness. And now the time has come when they're back in the promised land. They have been conquering all around. But now Caleb at 85 
comes to Joshua, the leader, and makes a statement to him in Joshua 14, 10 through 12. He says, Amen, uh, Amen. I, I am this day 85 years old, and yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war to go out to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day, and uh, the Lord will be with me. The Anakim are there, the giants are there, he says, uh, but the Lord will be with me, and I will be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. So here is a man that is 85. He is not going into retirement. Uh, he is not going into, I'm, uh, you know, uh, settling into my wheelchair to live that way for the rest of my life. No, there's a mountain that God has for me with my name on it. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, uh, and I want that mountain. God said he's going to give me that mountain, uh, and he rose up, and he, he did it, and they won that battle. They got that mountain. 85 years old. When Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple. Uh, and there's two older, pro a prophet named Simeon and a prophetess named Anna that both were blessed by God to be able to hold the Messiah, to be able to prophesy about him. Simeon is an older man. Amen. He said in that place, he said, God has told me I would not die until I saw the Lord's Christ. He's at the point of death. He's at the end of his life. And God said, I'm going to let you see the Christ before you die. He held Jesus in his arms. And also Anna, it says she had been faithful to God. God. She had, her husband had died very early on, and now she's older in life, probably in her 70s or 80s. She is in the temple of God every day with fastings and prayers, prophesying and speaking of the Messiah to all that would come. And so here are older people that God used very powerfully. So here's my point. Every life counts with God. His divine purpose is available to each one of us, from a child to the oldest among us. And our text gives us this understanding, verse 12, help us to interpret our lives correctly. In other words, God, help me to see the potential you see in my life. Powerful potential. So let's think secondly about short-circuited. So what short-circuits this potential that God has placed in our lives? There's a very real trap that is in the world around us, and it is the trap of immaturity. It short-circuits this. The world promotes the Peter Pan mentality. What does that mean? I mean, stay young as long as you can. Don't have any responsibilities. Just live the fun life and, and throw off responsibility. Uh, amen. Uh, and on purpose, delay maturity, delay growing up, stay young, uh, you know, live that way. Don't take any responsibility. Uh, don't volunteer for anything that requires work. Uh, and uh, the old saying is YOLO, you only live once. So you've got to have all the fun you can have now. Well, the Bible says you only live once. So you should number your days. Very different mindset. Very different perspective that God brings. So the world promotes this. Have fun instead of taking time to be productive and to build up your potential. Screens are a big part of this. Spend hours on a screen. And you know what? This really isn't determined by age. It's not just young people that are immature. It ensnares young and old alike. There's people that are way past their teen years that just will not grow up. They refuse to accept and carry responsibility. I was thinking about what's a definition of maturity. Maturity is when you accept responsibility and you carry the responsibility. That's what it means to be mature. 
That can be, you can do that very young. Or you can be very old and not get it yet. It's a trap. Some will not focus on what is important in life, only on fun. And that can be somebody much down the road in age. It's a trap. Immaturity is a trap. The problem with this is it delays development in your life and in mine. It diminishes the potential of a life. When time, think about this, when time is not used productively, listen, time is lost. And you can never regain time. The opportunity you had yesterday to develop your potential, to grow in God, is gone. And you can never get that day back, ever. That's what immaturity does. It wastes time. Time is a gift from God. The opportunity to grow, the opportunity to learn, to advance is, can, is lost as well and never regained. It delays the development, the time wasters, the time wasters, steal potential. When you're immature, you're overly focused on self. You know, the mark of immaturity is that it's all about me. Right? That's what immaturity is about. Maturity realizes there's a bigger picture. There's other people around. There's more people involved. There's more issues than just me. And the Bible tells us as a Christian, we're supposed to deny ourselves. Take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. Immaturity says, oh, no, no, you don't want to deny yourself. You want to indulge yourself. So immaturity traps us in a posture where we're not obeying Christ. We're not developing. Our mind is filled with temporary things instead of being filled with the eternal things. We lack revelation. <clears throat> so this is the trap of immaturity and the poster child for immaturity is one of David's sons named Absalom. So here is this guy, he has potential man. He is a gifted man. He can speak well, he has the ability to influence people to but he's trapped by immaturity. We have an account in 2 Samuel 13 where uh, Absalom's sister Tamar is uh, seduced by one of his half-brothers, Amnon. So there's a problem in the family. Amnon rapes Tamar. So yes, it's a violation, absolutely the truth. But the way Absalom responds uh, is he doesn't say anything in the moment, but he plots his revenge for two years. He just goes dark. He, he ghosts Amnon and everybody else. And behind the scenes, he's plotting his revenge on this man who is his half-brother, part of his family. He's plotting his revenge, uh, amen, against this man. And after two years... Uh, he made an arrangement where he invited all the king's sons, uh, amen, to his house for a dinner. Uh, none of them could come. David wouldn't allow them. Uh, he said, well, then just send Amnon. And when he sent Amnon, uh, the servants of Absalom killed him. Two years in the making, he plotted revenge. And then as soon as he did that, he ran away to live in a different land. He took off. He avoided the responsibility. He avoided accountability for what he did. He took revenge and then ran away. That's immature. Later, he's restored. He's brought back to the kingdom. But he's a very vain man. <laughs> this crazy account of him, 2 Samuel 14, 
25 and 26, and all Israel, there was none to be so much as praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. When he cut his hair at the end of the year, he cut it at the end of the year, he weighed the hair of his head at five pounds after the king's weight. In other words, every year he had a public haircut. So everybody could admire his hair. A very vain, vain man. And by the way, he did this when he was married and had kids. Very vain, very full of himself. Absalom loved Absalom. Immature. A little bit later, we find out that because of his drama that he causes all the time, he's not invited to King David's court for two years. Basically, he's being ignored because every time he comes around, it's nothing but drama. So the way, because he's being ignored, he gets angry at this. So his solution is 1 Samuel 14, 29 through 32. Absalom sent for Joab, the, the general, to send him to the king, but Joab would not come. He sent the second time, so he wouldn't come. He's being, he's being ignored. Therefore, he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. So Joab arose and came to Absalom. Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom said, Because I sent to you, saying, Come here, that I may send you to the king. So his solution is to set the field on fire to get attention. Burn down somebody else's crops so he could get the attention that he wanted. That's immaturity. Later, he develops into full-on rebellion, right? So he has this plot again, and he develops this thing where he becomes the king. He runs out his father... He runs out his court. He established his own rule and his own court and set himself on the throne. And uh, amen, later, uh, amen, in the battle that happens, uh, he's riding uh, his mule, uh, amen, which the king's sons rode, uh, and he's riding his mule, but his long hair, uh, amen, caught him at the end because he's riding uh, and it got caught in an oak tree. And he's hanging from his hair in the oak tree, and Joab comes and puts a dart in his heart and kills him. So here's the point. Here's a guy that was the king's son, had all the blessings and potential of a king's son before him in his life, but he got trapped by immaturity. It destroyed the potential of this man's life. It destroyed what God had created him for. It destroyed and completely messed up everything God had in store for him, amen, because uh, he could not get out of that trap. He wouldn't judge it and get out of it. And so it reveals uh, the trap of immaturity that the devil sets for us in this world today uh, and how devastating it is uh, when the trap of immaturity is work in a life, uh, it stunts development, uh, it damages destiny, it destroys potential, and it hurts others. It wastes precious time given to us by God. God gives every person 24 hours in a day. Every person has that gift every day. And what we do with time makes or breaks the future. And immaturity steals time. As our text says, our lifetime comes to an end and it finishes with nothing but a sigh. Life's over. Well, it's very wise for us to avoid the trap of immaturity and to step up into our potential like God wants us to. And that's what I want to close with is pursuing God's plan 
And we do this by living life God's way. It is taking hold of what God says to do and how to live in his word and then applying that in our lives on a daily basis. God in his eternal wisdom has a prescription for how to live life in a way that brings potential to pass. This is what our text is filled with. It brings this truth, brother and sister, life is fleeting. You don't have forever. I just preached on Sunday about Jesus coming back. Listen, the door to the ark is getting ready to be closed. Turkey just came out the last couple days and said, I'm not going to support Israel, and they're in talks with Russia and Iran. That's Ezekiel 38 and 39. Those three nations are going to come together against Israel. We're right there. You don't have forever. I don't have forever. The rapture can literally come at any second, brother and sister. By the way, your life can end at any second. And so can mine. Life is fleeting. That means time must be seized. Time must be utilized for God while it's available because it's slipping through the hourglass. Psalm 90 again, 9 and 10. All our days are passed away and our years are like a tale that is told. The days of our years are 70 and if by reason of strength they be eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. You have to understand this. So in the context of that, verse 12 is God's wisdom. Verse 12, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Contemporary English version. Teach us to use wisely all the time that we have. Amen. That's God's wisdom. That's God's truth. That's God's way. That's how God says we should live our life. Amen. In that manner. James 4 gives a very powerful statement in the New Testament about how to live life and how to function in decisions and how to utilize time in a way that's going to honor God and, and fulfill our potential with God. And life choices are very important and we need to make choices to use time in line with God's will, in line with God's plan. And listen to the words of James 4, 13 through 17. And uh, what it has to say to us, again, the remedy version. Pay close attention, especially those who say, in the next few days, we're going to move to a new city and live there a year, open a business, and make huge profits. You don't know what the future holds. Your life is like a vapor trail. It's here one minute and gone the next. You might not even be alive in a year. So stop being so rigid with your pre-planning. It only increases your stress. Instead, trust God with your future and how things will turn out. Learn to say, if it is in harmony with God's plan for my life, then that is what I will do. And you will worry so much less. As it is, you focus on yourselves. You brag, boast, and try to control everything in order to advance your own agenda. All selfishness is destructive. Again, that's immaturity. Verse 17, anyone who knows God's methods of love but chooses selfishness deviates from God's design for life. That's the verse that says, if you know to do good and you don't do it to you, it is sin. That's that verse. And in the context, it's talking about planning. It's talking about what to do with life. 
So we should not make plans based on what is uncertain, a vapor. We should not waste a year to move to a location just for a job. We should trust and obey the word of God. In other words, don't be immature. Don't allow, amen, yourself to make a decision in the emotion of the moment or, or how it seems right now. Maturity looks down the road. Maturity grasps what my decisions are going to bring in my life and thinks through the flow and the consequences of those decisions. Do what's right in the right time. That's what the lesson of those verses is. Live life God's way, not our own way, not mature immaturity, not the way the world says to live, but live life God's way because this brings about God's plan. Lamentations 3.27, it is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth, to start young, to start now, bear the yoke. What does that mean? Accept responsibility and carry responsibility. This is God's wisdom. This is how we should live our life. Remember Jesus. The only snapshot we have of him at, at a young age is at the age of 12 when he goes to Jerusalem and his parents leave on the caravan back to Nazareth and they don't find Jesus. They come back and find him three days later in the temple and he says, I must be about my father's business. And at 12, he was talking to the teachers of the law about the word of God. He was having discussions with them, had conversation with them, asked them questions. They asked him questions. There was a, a knowledgeable conversation about the Bible from Jesus at 12. He took on the yoke. And remember, he stepped into public ministry at 30. But let me say something to you. The reason Jesus had the ministry he had is because he used the 18 years from 12 to 30. He used that time well. You don't step into a public ministry. Poof. There's preparation involved. There's development. The Bible says Jesus grew in wisdom. Wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That was 18 years worth of that before he became the public minister rabbi at age 30. So he started young. He took on the yoke at 12. And he fulfilled his potential, obviously, by that kind of a life, that living of that way of life. He utilized time for eternal business. He numbered his days. So this is the truth, brother and sister, the fullness of the amazing potential of your life. Whether you're a child, a teenager, middle-aged or older, is still unrealized. Right? We haven't reached our full potential yet. You haven't reached your full potential yet in God. And now's the time to step forward into maturity and to pursue your destiny in God and in the will of God for your life and what he has planned for you. This is the powerful dimension that we can step into. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, in the contemporary English version. When we were children, we thought and reasoned as children do. But when we grew up, we quit our childish ways. Another version, when I was a child, I spoke about childish matters. For I saw things like a child and reasoned like a child. But the day came when I matured and I set aside my childish ways. Again, no one here has forever. And the time that is passing by is time that will never be regained. Now's the time to utilize that time. Now's the time to be productive for God. Now's the time to take on maturity and to take on the yoke and to seize the time that you still have left to you and to realize your God-given potential and you can realize it with your life. 
So I want to close with a few examples of some people who did amazing things. Does anybody know what Braille is? Right? Braille is the little dots that they give you to read. The, the blind can read. I never understand why they put them in ATMs, drive through ATMs, but anyways. Braille is named for a man named Louis Braille. Now check this out. He was blind, very young in life. He had, I think, some kind of an accident. He went blind. So at 13, he is in some kind of a school for the blind. They had some form of that for the blind to read, but it was very cumbersome. It didn't work well. So Louis Braille began working on a dot system for the blind to read. It absorbed all his spare time and vacation for the next two to three years. So from 13 to 15, 16, he was working on the Braille system. He finished it in that time, and that is still used by the blind to read today. Pretty amazing what a blind teenager did. Potential was realized, right? <coughs> I'm reading a book called The Great Bridge. It's the story of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge in New York in the 1870s. And uh, just one little note, they found a way in the 1870s to have a huge box probably close to the size of this, our whole building here, that was down on the riverbed. They put compressed air in the box, drove out all the water, and men would go down into there and dig by hand down to the riverbed and they sunk the foundation of those towers that still stand to this day. They did that by hand in the 1870s. And there was an engineer named Washington Roebling. His dad had designed it and his dad died and at 31, Washington Roebling took over the project of the Brooklyn Bridge. And he's the chief engineer that thought through every nuance and every detail of all that happened in that bridge from the foundation to the stones to the cabling and how it was wired and it still stands to this day. A 31 year old man took on responsibility. Anybody ever heard of Vera Wang? I only know the name from stuff my wife's buy, wife buys, but I guess she's some global fashion designer. You know, she started doing that at the age of 40. Anybody heard of Colonel Sanders? Mm -hmm. Colonel Sanders at 65 got his first social security check and he said, I need to change my life, man. And he started Kentucky Fried Chicken mm -hmm. at 65. Anybody heard of Ray Kroc? Anybody know who Ray Kroc is? Ray Kroc's the owner of McDonald's. At 59 years old, he bought the shares of McDonald's from the two little guys that started it. I've been to the original stand in California where it was, one of the original stores. And it was just a couple stores selling some burgers. Ray Kroc bought it at 59, and to this day, they've actually lost count because McDonald's has literally sold billions of hamburgers. He started when he was 59. Laura Ingalls Wilder, who wrote a little series called Little House on the Prairie, which is a, a book series that I would recommend anybody to read. It's actually the story of people who pioneered. They went in a covered wagon out to the middle of nowhere, and they said, okay, this looks like a good spot. And she's a little girl, and she wrote her stories. Her first book was not published until she was 64 years old. Pastor Mitchell took over the Prescott Church at 41 years old and built our fellowship with the rest of his life. So what can your life do? What does God have planned for you? Oh, he has amazing things planned for your life. Don't let the devil lie to you and so you're just a little, whatever you think you are. I'm just this, I'm just that. No, oh, no, you're a son of God. You're a child of God. He's your creator. You're made in his image. 
you have potential in him. And if you will take that on, you'll begin to labor for that. Utilize your time wisely. You can realize your potential. Only God knows what you can do with your life for his glory <clears throat> and how he can use you because he has amazing things planned for you. So young people, all of us that aren't young, children even, take hold of it. Realize your own potential in God. Number your days. Number your days. Don't get trapped by immaturity. Number your days. Let God use your life, amen, down here on this earth. Let's bow our heads together. We can realize our potential in God. Glory to God. We are able to realize it. We are able to see it come to pass. It's his plan. It's his will. It's his purpose. It's his design. And we wrestle with this. We sometimes don't want what God has for us. We want to go to heaven. But we really want to live our life. And I, I remember a time, amen, my, my son, he's coming of age in the Tempe church. He's probably at that time about 17 or 18 or so. And he got a word from evangelist Chris Hart. And Chris Hart told him, uh, son, you've said in your heart to me, do I have to? And God told him, yes, it's my plan. It is my plan for you from before you were born. And Preston wrestled with that for a little bit. But I tell you today, the last couple of years, him and his wife, Savannah, they've taken on the yoke. They just moved from a four bedroom, 1900 square foot house to a little house in Mesa, 940 square feet, two bedrooms because he wants to be close to the church so that he can give himself to the ministry. He's striving to be involved as much as possible and to get sent out. He's taken on the yoke. He's chosen wisely. We all have our wrestling points. We all have our times. Immaturity lies and says, you got lots of time. You can always serve God later. Actually, you can't because if you waste youth, you get in the habit of life and you don't want to serve God later. That's the truth. You get stuck. A lot harder to let go of things after you take them on. And I urge you and I challenge you and I encourage you, young people, older folks, all of us alike, Christians, realize your potential. Teach us, Lord, teach us, God, to number our days, to use them for eternity, not to waste time. Time is short. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. You do not know the Lord. And you think as well, maybe you think this, well, I can get saved later. Maybe you're a backslider and you think that you're going to have more time. and One day you'll get it right with God. And soon you have every intention of going to heaven, but you want to live in your fun for a while first. You're playing a very dangerous game, my friend, for you don't even know what tomorrow brings, the Bible says. You might not wake up tomorrow. Oh, I'm young. Lots of young people die. Maybe you're not saved and you don't even realize that you have potential in God. Can I tell you, the Lord God who created you, who formed you in your mother's womb, he has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you that is greater than anything we can, any of us can do in our own. He has a plan. He has an eternal purpose. And your life has great potential in him. 
and in Christ. And if you will give your heart over to Jesus, you'll turn from your sin. Sin is destroying you. Sin is defiling your spirit, your mind, your thoughts, your heart. It's taking you to hell. Because the devil has a plan for you too. It's to take you to hell. That's his plan. But God's plan is blessing. God's plan is favor. God's plan is heaven at the end of life. God's plan is a life that is productive, a life that is used for him and for his glory. And that's you, and you're not saved, and you want to get right with God, you want to turn to the Lord with all your heart, then I urge you and encourage you, now is your chance to respond. Seize the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time, the Bible says. Now is your moment. Unsaved or backslidden, that's you. You want to pray. You want to get your heart right with God. We'd be honored to pray with you and help you to pray and get your heart right with God at this altar. Anybody at all, you're unsaved or backslidden, you want to get right with God, lift up your hand. I see you right there. Right? Thank you. Anyone else? Come on, just lift up your hand. God's dealing with you. God's stirring your heart. Your life counts for eternity, but it has to be surrendered to Jesus. It has to be serving Him. Not playing with sin, not living a life away from God, but a life that is surrendered, a life that is wholly sold out for Him. Amen. That's what God has for you. One last call. Lift your hand. God's dealing with you or backslider or you've never been saved and you want to get saved. Just please lift up your hand. God's dealing with you. We help you. Amen. Okay, then. You lifted your hand. Amen. Come on, Isaiah. Come on. One of our brothers is going to come pray with you, man. God bless you. Okay? God's got good things for you, all right? Just kneel down right here. Amen. Abel's coming. Thank you very much. Let's all stand together, church. I don't want to re-preach the sermon. I encourage you. The altar's open. You come and speak to God about your life. You come and speak to God about your choices. Amen. Your potential that you're de deciding, God, I want what you have for me. God, I'm tired of wasting time. I'm tired of just spending life on what doesn't matter. Help me, God, to number my days. Come on, young people. I, st I stir you and I encourage you. Be all in for Jesus right now. Now's the time to serve Jesus with all your life and all your heart and be a blessing to God and serve him with all the days of your life. Amen. We're going to sing a song of praise to the Lord. Hallelujah. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all Worship you. With all I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in.
Amen. My uh, pastor is fond of saying the biggest room in the world is the room for self improvement. What that means is that all of us can grow. All of us can right, be enlarged. All of us can be stretched. And one of the things we face sometimes is that God won't make us. He makes an offer and then leaves the choice up to us. Have you ever wondered why is it that one person can get saved and they just take off in God? And somebody else gets saved and they always struggle or they flounder? Why is that? Is God different? It's the person's response to God. That's the difference. Right? Jesus said, "If and the Bible says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Out of the 12 disciples with Jesus, three of them were always with Jesus. Peter, James, and John. And then John was even closer. He laid his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. And Jesus allowed each one of his followers to determine how close they were to him. He loved them all the same, but he allowed them to choose. You know, it's only Peter, James, and John that were on the mountain of transfiguration. It's only Peter, James, and John that went in with Jairus, his daughter, and saw Jesus raise that little 12-year-old girl from the dead. There were some things Jesus only allowed them to be a part of because of their approach to him. Same is true for all of us. So I want to encourage you. Amen. You, utilize your time for God. Utilize your time. Amen. Number your days. Make them count for eternity every single day. Doesn't mean there's it's wrong to have a, a little fun and, and have some downtime. I understand that. There's a balance to this. Jesus had downtime. But the truth is, it's learning to number our days take hold of time when the opportunities are given to us and to do what we need to do in the moment, the right now moments that God gives us. Don't let them get wasted. Don't let them fall away. Right? Our Bible reading is either today or yesterday. Jesus tells the parable about the two sons that come before the father. The father says to the one son, go and work in my field. He says, no. But then afterwards, it says he repented and he went. The other one, go and work in my field. Yes, Father. Yes, sir, I'm going. But he never went. And Jesus said, which of the two did the will of the Father? Which of the two was mature? Not the one who said yes, but the one who did yes. That's the issue. So I want to encourage you. I mean, I know it's a little sombering sermon tonight, but listen, this is where potential comes from. This is where potential is realized. This is where potential begins to develop in our lives is when we will take time, when we will, we will seize the moments. I don't know if anybody else caught this, but I was very interested. Um, in the memorial stones from Sunday morning, 
Pastor Greg was talking about the sun coming up and he said that morning he was up at four. It's Sunday. He's preaching. Why didn't he sleep later? Because he's seizing the moment. That's why he's our leader. So I want to just challenge you and let God speak to you. And whether or not you can be, if you came to the altar, follow through on what you said. If you didn't come to the altar, then I want to encourage you just to say to God, you know what, God, teach me. Help me to understand this. Help me to see how I can use my time more effectively for you. And you know what, God might just tell you one thing to adjust. God's gracious. He's not going to give you the whole load today. But whatever it is tonight, tomorrow, that you need to adjust, adjust it. Utilize the time in that way that God says. And then just keep following that prompting. And that's where the potential comes. That's where it begins to be realized in your life and mine. And God has good things for us, church. If these people can do these amazing things, not even saved, we can do some great things for God. Amen. God has a plan for us. God has a purpose for your life and mine. And he can use your life. And I want to encourage you in it. Amen. Go from this place realizing the great potential you have in God. And that if you will seize time, if you'll number the days, you'll be able to realize that potential. Amen. So I want to encourage you. Amen. Friday night's our street preaching outreach. I encourage you to come out for this. Young people especially. I want to encourage you for that. Amen. And then also our outreach at the assisted living center on on um on saturday which by the way is seizing the moment man right john called me a while back somebody was passing away in there so sometimes people pass away and it's the last opportunity they have to hear the gospel to hear about jesus before they cross that line into eternity so it's a very worthy ministry and i want to encourage you for that and then also then is the nighttime or trunk or treat right amen I, I have plans. Okay, no problem. Uh, we'll be here utilizing our time for the kingdom of God, not to say plans are evil, nothing like that. But I'm just saying, you know, we have a great opportunity. It is one of our best outreaches all year long. And I want to encourage you to be a part of it. Amen. It's an opportunity to reach people for Jesus, touch them in a way that we don't normally touch them, and be able to help impact them for Christ. And I want to encourage you in that. And then please don't forget, Sunday is the deliverance services. We're going to be praying for people to get healed, delivered, set free. Take a few of those flyers and invite some people around you. Amen. That need God's help. Amen. Maybe you're a crazy neighbor. You're like, that guy needs to be delivered. Yeah, let him, invite him, help him to come. And let's believe God to touch him, okay? We're going to believe God. Please be praying for that. And please pray for our building. Amen. I'll keep you updated when I hear some things, but... We need God to give us favor there in that new opportunity. So, amen. God bless you tonight. We'll bow our heads and be dismissed in prayer. God, thank you for your people. Thank you for every, one, every life that is here, every potential, God, even from the children, God, all the way up to the older veterans of the cross. God, thank you for every one of the people of God. Bless them. Raise them up to your will and potential and destiny for their lives. Each one of us, may we see the fulfillment of your promises for us. We love you. We praise you. Go with your people. Keep them safe. Bring us back safely in the victory of the Lord. In Jesus' name, God bless you tonight. Amen. God be with you. Stick around. Hallelujah. Oh, and we need to move the chairs, please, to where? These chairs? No, no, from the prayer, from the storage. If you can help with the chairs, just meet Richard right over here by this door. That will be a great help. Thank you.